Well, good afternoon, everyone. We'll go and get started. You're just like the mail carriers. Neither snow nor sleet nor rain would stop you from talking about athletics. So, congratulations. Off to a great start. That went run over really well. So, uh, <laughs> I am told that this is being taped. So, uh, for those of you who would care to go back and tell your colleagues that couldn't be here uh, that they can see it in a day or so, it'll be up on my uh, website. Uh, there'll be a link to it, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, answer any questions you have today. I have some slides I'd like to run through and then just open it up for questions. So. Uh, let me start kind of with this disclaimer, if you will, uh, and that is this is part of a larger university strategy to improve our entire institution. And no decisions have been made. This is a kind of a point of discussion. Um, we do have the support of our Board of Regents to uh, pursue kind of all possible avenues. Uh, but I just want to throw out at the outset that we have not been invited by a conference to, to join them, uh, nor have we made, submitted an application to change the classification of football. I just want to start with that uh, as we uh, begin our discussion so it will help inform, I hope, um, uh, the dialogue today. I want to start by first putting up a quote from one of my favorites, Sir Winston Churchill, uh, and, and kind of in the context of what happened just in the last 10 days. Um, it was an interesting session. Uh, I had Wes Robinson from the, the Progress come and see me the other day, and he said, well, tell me about your first uh, legislative session in Kentucky. And 90 minutes later, we, uh, we wrapped up the interview. Uh, issues are often the same. They face uh, states uh, across our country, but certainly the players change. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we came out pretty well. And I want to... Uh, just briefly, and I sent this out in my message to everybody campus-wide, kind of give you a summary of what happened uh, in terms of our, both our budget and investment in capital projects. First, I couldn't be more pleased for Mal Frisbee and John Wade and his, uh, his, their colleagues uh, in our College of, uh, of Science for the new Science Phase Two. Tom, you'll finally have a, a facility to match the, the quality of our staff and students, and, and uh, I couldn't be more pleased. This, is going to be uh, an enormous benefit to our campus. And I got a little ahead of myself uh, saying that we can break ground in July. Uh, it'll take probably till August. So uh, we'll wait probably till the end of August when students are back for uh, the groundbreaking. Also, $2 million for our aviation program. That's a big deal. $75 million approval for a, a public private partnership. And you'll hear more about this. But as we've looked at our student housing in particular and our bed inventory, there are ways that we need to improve. Uh, what we have, and this is merely an approval to pursue some of these partnerships if they're uh, deemed appropriate and, uh, and, uh, and the best possible um, kind of avenue for us to achieve our ultimate objective. Uh, this certainly comes into play later as I talk about facilities, but we got $15 million in agency bond approval uh, to address some of the deferred maintenance issues that we have with regard to our facilities. And last but certainly not least, $136 million in ongoing funds. Uh, that's, of course, is the biennium. So we went over the budget sheets yesterday with the presidents. And on balance, we actually came out slightly ahead, even with the cut, if you consider the amount that we have to invest for our KRS uh, uh, portion uh, and the state's uh, allocation. So all in all, it was a really good session. I want to thank two people in particular. Uh, Craig Turner, the chair of our board, who on a daily basis was on the phone uh, talking to key people at pivotal moments, and David McFadden, uh, my, my partner in crime up there. We spent a lot of time in Frankfurt. Uh, David was there, keeping with the policy, must be present to win on Saturday and Sunday mornings. Uh, he got there Saturday at, what, 9 a.m. and stayed until Sunday morning at 6.30 in the morning. So I want to thank them, and I'll thank, thank all of you also who made calls, sent emails, uh, wrote notes. Our Board of Regents went up there in uh, February uh, for our retreat, and it made a difference. So uh, again, a, a pretty good outcome given where we were 10 to 12 days ago, uh, and uh, I think a success for us. You know, again, some renderings of what phase two is going to look like. Let me start, too, with uh, another quote. This is from Daniel Burnham. Anybody tell me who Daniel Burnham was? Architect. Who said that? Uh, 
Of course, well, if, yeah, Keith would know he's an architect. Nice job, Keith. Uh, Daniel Burnham, what did he do, Keith? So the, the city of Chicago, as Keith rightly stated, is uh, thanks in large part the, the form and function of the, of the city itself, the magnificent buildings, the way it's uh, f uh, framed and laid out is thanks to, uh, to uh, Daniel Burnham. Keith was kind enough to come by my office to drop off a book. It's a novel called The Devil in the White City, which is about uh, uh, Mr. Burnham and, and uh, a murder case. But he said this about make no little plans they have no magic to stir men's blood. This is really a unique time for us uh, to consider what big plans we can make. Uh, just a couple examples of Mr. Burnham's designs, which for their age were incredibly uh, forward thinking and well beyond their time. This is the Flatiron Building in New York City, and that's the Masonic Temple in, uh, in downtown Chicago. In the latter part of that quote uh, from Mr. Burnham, Make big plans, aim high in hope and work. Remember that our sons and our grandsons, and I would add our granddaughters as well, are going to do things that would stagger us. Let your watchword be order and your beacon beauty. This is a really unique opportunity for us as a campus community to come together and to address uh, some of the acute challenges that we face, but to put into place too um, infrastructure and plans and programs that will far outlive our tenure at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, if you don't think athletics make a difference, um, you can't read probably some of this copy, but there's a little bit here about what happened last year to Florida Gulf Coast University when they made the Sweet 16. How they went from overall websites uh, visits went to 230,000 not including the ones that 117,000 people that went directly to the website. So some actually went through the academic portal, if you will. Some went directly to the, uh, the athletic website. Look at the University of Dayton, the attention they garnered as a result of their run. App State, when they beat Michigan there in the big house a few years ago, they say, saw almost a 25% increase in applications uh, at their school. So we live in a society that, of course, pays attention to athletics. And uh, we were the beneficiary of that just recently. Uh, my brother-in-law called me from California and said, have you seen USA Today? And there is Glenn Cosey and the rest of our team on the front page of the sports section. Uh, as is my ritual on Sunday night, I read the New York Times. And this is the Saturday section from the, uh, the, the New York Times after we battled Kansas. Uh, and the whole article was about this scrappy, pesky little group from Eastern Kentucky. Uh, and we certainly got Kansas' attention and the rest of the country with our performance. Uh, is Gene Palka here? Colonel Palka is not here, but this is the most animated I've ever seen Gene, right here. <laughs> he was the one face I, could, uh, I wanted to show off. Uh, his wife, you can kind of see down there to the side, but it was, a great, it was a great thing to be there in St. Louis. And, I was even more proud of the fact that uh, our kids comported themselves in such a way that it brought real repute uh, and renown to the, to the university. They behaved like gentlemen, our fans were terrific. It was, uh, it was a great event for the university. In terms of our current athletic program, this is what we have both in women's sports and men's sports. So Mark, how many spo sponsored sports is that? 17. And on average, that's about normal for a school our size. Um, I'll call on Mark periodically and also Simon today uh, to provide some uh, additional information. This is a kind of a snapshot of our student demographic uh, for our student athletes. You can see the total number, the in-state, out-of-state. Uh, the target, what does that target mean? Oh, the target tuition, okay. So these are the ones that are on full scholarship. You can see that the partial scholarship athletes, uh, well over 100, and we've got 96 walk-ons. And so we collect as a result of those student athletes that come, not on a scholarship, but those that pay their way almost $4 million in tuition and fees. Um, also look at, uh, and one of the hallmarks I hope of my uh, administration will be a commitment to diversity and inclusion, and the the composition 
of our student athlete population is more, almost three to one, more diverse than our, uh, our university population. Look at the student success of our student athletes. Uh, on average, 39% six year graduation rate. For our student athletes, 62%. Retention rate, 64 for the university, 85 for athletics. Our graduation is number one in terms of the rate in the, the Commonwealth, third in the OVC. Uh, I just attended a couple days ago our breakfast to recognize our student athletes that have partic done particularly one, uh, well in athletics. Uh, 95 on the Dean's List, Colonel Scholars, you can see the numbers there. We won last year the Institutional Sportsmanship Award and the Commissioner's Cup. They take the place that your teams fi uh, finish in all sports and add it up, and we won the Commissioner's Cup in 2012. How many times have we won that? Once. Come in second every other time, but uh, that was a red letter, big pardon, maroon letter day for uh, the university. Here is our budget as it relates to other institutions in the Ohio Valley Conference, the conference in which we currently find ourselves. You can see the Jacksonville State, uh, which has put a great deal, and I'll show you in a second a slide of their facilities uh, into their infrastructure, Tennessee Tech, and we're third, slightly ahead of Murray State. Uh, does not have football. That's the only one on here that does not have football. So you can see Belmont, and they've done well in uh, other sports recently. They have a pretty sizable budget when you factor that they do not have football, which you'll see in a second how much we spend on football. This is a, a proposed renovation to Austin P Stadium. Uh, I've been down to Jacksonville State. They did a, a pretty ingenious thing, and they put the new grandstand with uh, the suites and the presence box and uh, all the amenities that you would see at a larger stadium on the back side of a new student dorm. So they actually got an appropriation from the state uh, for new housing and then built the stadium literally on top of it and on the side of it. This is our football budget. So you can see how much we spend. And when I say our football budget, it's made up of three components, scholarships, uh, personnel, uh, our pay for our staff or for our coaches, and of course, money getting up and down the road, the operating expense. You can see that uh, Liberty University, which is uh, in Virginia, uh, they spend a great deal on one sport. All the way down to Sam Houston State, which played for a national championship two years ago uh, in FCS. So a breakdown of what we spend our athletic budget on gives you an idea. Personnel, getting up and down the road, and scholarships. So when you say, well, why are we spending money on athletics? Just like our overall university budget, which is about 80% tied to people, our athletic budget is spent on scholarships and on salaries, the great majority of it. Now, uh, in terms of revenue and how we generate revenue for athletics, uh, you can see that in the last uh, five years, we've increased the revenue that the department has generated by almost 20%. And that comes from these areas, ticket sales, guarantee games, partnerships, with uh, corporations fundraising and N uh, NCAA and OVC uh, funds. Mark, to go to the tournament, how much do we collect uh, going to the NCAA tournament for the NCAA? For every game played. And is that divided among the, all the conference members? So you got, what, 12 conference members, uh, uh, 200,000 plus dollars. Uh, for every game played. It's not a whole lot of money, but still it's more uh, if none of your teams uh, make it to the tournament. We are, have the advantage of an automatic bid, of course, in the OVC. Some conferences have multiple bids. Uh, the SEC has, happens to have, what, two teams in the Final Four. So uh, we'll get to conference and strength in, in just a second. Um, guarantee games. You hear more and more about these, and uh, this next season we will play Miami of Ohio, and the Swamp, we'll go down the Swamp and play the University of Florida. When I had a chance to tell our student senate the other day that we were playing Florida, I had one student say, you mean the University of Florida? And I said, yeah, the University of Florida. Uh, this is not Florida Trade Tech or whatever, this is, we're playing the Gators in the Swamp, and we are getting paid, Mark, how much? Yeah. 
It's a lot of money. It's five. It's north of five hundred thousand uh, dollars. And then if you add the other Miami game, the other revenue game, uh, they are uh, substantial investments in our program. Now, where we currently are in the OVC, we've been there since 1948. Uh, it is a Division I conference, and some ask us, well, are you Division I? And we are Division I in everything. Now, in football, there are two divisions. There's what we call the Football Bowl subdivision and the Football Championship subdivision. And we'll get into those specifics in just a second, but the Ohio Valley Conference is one of a handful of conferences in the country that has Division I sports and everything from men's tennis to women's volleyball, uh, and then has FCS football. This gives you an idea of what teams are out there. And you can take a look at the map. Uh, Wyoming really is not that big, but that is the only team in that part of the country that is what we call FBS. So Wyoming, uh, you take in North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, uh, it's the only one in that region, just like Nebraska is in its region. Now in California, we'll have several uh, FBS um, schools. The difference between the two is, of course, level of competition, and part of that is attributable to the fact that you have a different number of scholarships. In FBS, you have 85 scholarships, FCS 63. 13 conferences in FCS, the ones that I mentioned before. I came from the Big Sky Conference at Southern Utah. Uh, the Southern Missouri Valley, Ohio Valley, uh, Colonial, those are some that uh, you may recognize. The peers in, our, in, our, uh, in this division of football, Eastern Illinois, Delaware, postseason, there is one playoff. It starts usually, what, last week in, in November, and they play the championship game uh, the first week in January, and they expanded it this year to 24 teams. Conversely, football bowls subdivision, uh, has all of these various conferences, and they have 39 bowls now that include 78 teams. Now some have said, you know, the NCAA tournament making it is a really big deal, and it is a big deal. There are over 320 basketball programs, Division I in the country. Uh, only 64 get to go to the tournament, which means we are in the 19th, we're, we're part of a group of 19% of the schools that made it to the tournament this year. Now these are the, uh, current member institutions of the OVC and how they stack up in terms of endowment, uh, their size, what kind of institution they are, uh, regional south or a, a considered a national university, and you get an idea, a feel for kind of the relative size of the schools that we have in the Ohio Valley Conference. Now, the reason I'm using the Sun Belt and I could use the Middle uh, American Conference uh, just as uh, readily. There are really only two conferences with possibly, when I say possibly, it's up to the member institutions to determine whether or not they're going to invite other schools to be members that may possibly have a slot open for a school that wants to make that jump from FCS to FBS. And the Sun Belt, you can see, is uh, really geographically concentrated in this part of the country with the two outliers uh, uh, up in uh, Moscow, Idaho, Idaho, and New Mexico State in Las Cruces, and they are football only in uh, the Sun Belt. To give you an idea of the institutions and how much they spend on their athletic budgets in the Sun Belt, Western Kentucky that is leaving for Conference USA uh, at the end of this uh, academic year spends $25 million on athletics. Uh, Eastern Kentucky, we're down here at 10.8, almost 11 million. So you can see we would fit kind of in that bottom quartile of schools within uh, the Sun Belt. App State and was it Georgia State or Georgia Southern that joined? Georgia Southern and App State are the two newest members into the Sun Belt as of this coming year. And they join officially on July 1. Okay. Here are some improvements that the schools within uh, the Sun Belt of Maine in terms of their stadium. This is App State, Georgia Southern. I'll have more pictures of Western Kentucky in just a second. I've been to this place. Uh, this is Texas State, the uh, alma mater of Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, that's what it looked like the first time we went there and played with Southern Utah. Then the second time we went down, two years later, this is what it looked like. 
And I'll tell you how they paid for that in just a second, because it wasn't money from the legislature. Uh, it was some private money, but a lot of it came from one particular source. This is our current makeup of our athletic department staff in terms of administrative positions, coaches, uh, and the total. So you can see where we kind of land uh, relative to our current peer set in the Ohio Valley Conference and how we would rate relative to the Sun Belt. Next, I'll give you an idea of personnel needs in terms of uh, what we would need if, if we were to make that advancement. This, again, is a wish list. This is not a have to. This is uh, what we would really, really like to do. But you get an idea of how far behind uh, we are. The, this is the NCAA maximum for uh, the number of full-time and other coaches. And you can see we are 14 below what is allowed within the rules of the NCAA. So if you say, well, if we were to make that move, what would be our financial uh, needs? This, again, is a uh, kind of a wish list, if you will, uh, of what it would take in terms of football scholarships. For other sports, we'd have to add two additional female sports uh, to, get, to make sure we're compliant with Title IX uh, regulations, uh, personnel, and facility enhancements. The video boards we've already added, and those are being paid for with the revenue games that I mentioned before. Uh, particularly the ones that are coming next year. Uh, football building improvements to Alumni Coliseum, lights that we've already put up at both uh, softball and baseball, and I understand tomorrow night, depending on the weather, will be our first ever game under the lights against Moorhead uh, out here at Turkey Hughes Field. And the tennis courts you'll see uh, being replaced here in the next little while. Now, let's talk for just a, a few minutes about why are we even having this conversation of uh, making a move? Why aren't we just content where we are? Uh, within the last three to four years, there have been tectonic shifts in the athletic landscape across the country. Uh, another wave is potentially coming, but I would, uh, I can't divine the future, but I would uh, surmise that chances are there will be some sort of moratorium either placed by the NCAA on future movements of schools from one division to another or future conference realignment, given how much change there has been. If I had told you that uh, 10 years ago, Western Kentucky would be moving to Conference USA or the University of Louisville would be going to the Atlantic Coast Conference, how many folks do you think would have believed me? Uh, there is no way 10 years ago Louisville would ever have been in a conversation about moving to the ACC. Now what has that done to their institution? They are now spoken of in the same breath with the schools they will be playing. Duke, North Carolina, NC State, Florida State, Clemson. Maryland left the ACC to go to uh, the Big Ten. So there continues to be uh, shifts uh, in the major, what we call the Big Five conferences. Now, what are some of the benefits uh, of FBS? Well, first off, uh, the share of the current Sun Belt makeup of the current conference, uh, 12 member conference, each school gets $1.2 million a year. We right now get about uh, less than $200,000 a year from the Ohio Valley Conference. Um, you are then provided an opportunity to play more lucrative guarantee football games. Mark, if you would stand up and amplify that part there about uh, if you're at a different level of football, what happens when you play the larger schools? And they played Alabama two years ago, Western did, and got what, 1.1 million or 1 million? $1 million. You also have increased exposure across several different media, uh, television, radio, uh, internet, uh, ESPN, you name it. You have the chance to renew rivalries with Western Kentucky, uh, Middle Tennessee State, Marshall, kind of our erstwhile rivals uh, that have moved on. Uh, the fact that, uh, for example, Western this last year had a chance to welcome the Naval Academy, uh, their team, to campus, and then 
will go to Annapolis and play them. Um, I think that would be a better, a bigger draw than playing nothing against Robert Morris, but instead of playing Robert Morris, you're playing Navy or Army or some of these other schools. There are some intangibles. Uh, this is, I would argue, an incontrovertible fact that a higher athletics profile has this inexorable impact on the university's image by increasing its uh, reputation, certainly its exposure. Mark can tell you stories. Are, are you really Division I? Is Eastern Division I? Or don't you play Division II? Because we are not in FBS in the Commonwealth, people, people often, uh, uh, to quote George Bush, misunderestimate uh, where we are within uh, kind of the, the athletic la landscape. The growing gap in Division I and also, I don't know if irrelevance, irrelevance is the right word, but the uncertainty of FCS. What will happen to FCS? No one can predict, but it's becoming, I would argue, less and less relevant. Uh, it's, a, it's in a very tenuous spot. So we have to answer the question, what's the best thing for us moving forward? Okay, now not that this is a correlation one-to-one, -one, but let me just give you some facts here as it relates to when Western Kentucky made the move from FCS to FBS. They made it officially in 2008, but they made the decision in 2006. You can see that their enrollment since then has gone up 13%. Their undergrad enrollment has increased uh, that much. Uh, their enrollment as it relates to us uh, is over 5,000 students larger. Their tuition has increased by 20%. Beg your pardon, we've increased by 20%. They've increased theirs by 22%. So how have they paid for it? We'll get to that in just a second. But there is a undeniable uh, fact. Again, you have to decide is there a correlation between the move uh, in athletics, but the exposure to the university, the investment they made in their facilities uh, is undeniable. You can see some of their facilities here. This uh, new suite here, this new kind of grandstand is named for uh, Coach Harbaugh, as in the father of the two sons, their athletic facilities, uh, their basketball facility. This is uh, baseball and this is softball. Now, this is an interesting chart because it tells you kind of where we are. We're in this kind of netherworld, if you will, of teams that used to be really, really good uh, and had a national reputation and actually won national championships. And ones like us, what has happened to them? So Georgia Southern has won six national FCS championships. Uh, you can see the title years. They went to the finals that many times. They were the runner-up that many times. Where did they go? The Sun Belt. Youngstown State, they won four titles. Their coach was Jim Tressel. Went from Youngstown State to Ohio State. You can see uh, they were runner-up a couple of times. App State went to the Sun Belt, EKU, we won with Coach Kidd. Coach Blankenship is here today. Uh, Marshall, they went independent, they went to the MAC, and they will now, uh, or now are in uh, Conference USA. So you can see these other schools too, Boise State, Monroe, UMass, Western. All of those schools have all won that one national championship. North Dakota State and Montana, some have said, well, if FBS is so great, why don't they make the move? Uh, it's a good question. In some ways, they've got nowhere to go. And when we were at Southern Utah, the outlier when the Big Sky was reconfigured was North Dakota. And nobody wanted to ever go to Grand Forks, North Dakota to play. But given the geographic footprint and how spread out it was, they have necessity had to go there and play. And oftentimes to get a team up there on a plane to play one volleyball match and turn around and come home would cost you $22,000, $25,000. This is kind of the grouping of conferences as we know it in the, in the country today. So you've got what they call the Power Five. These are the ones that in many ways are driving the ship. And I went to the NCAA convention in January and this was kind of that dirty little secret that nobody wanted to talk about. We all got together in a big room and did this kind of verbal dance and gymnastics. Uh, but everyone realized that no one can make a decision as to what's going to happen with the governance of the NCAA until these five say, all right, we're going to break away and we're going to run football the way we want to run it. Now, what that does is that has created what they call next the group of five. And what's the euphemism they use for the power five? 
the highly what? Highly resourced. They're called highly resourced uh, conferences. Now, ironically, within the highly resourced conferences, there is a big gap in terms of disparity between what Florida has or what UK has as opposed to Mississippi State uh, or even Ole Miss. Uh, it's the big difference between what the University of Utah has in the Pac-12 and what Oregon has or what Stanford has. So there's even disparity within the Power Five, but these undeniably have, uh, these conferences have the biggest, uh, the biggest sway. The next is the group of five. American Athletic, that used to be the former members of the Big East. The Big East broke away, took the name, and, and became a basketball-only conference. So you have in there now, uh, let's see, you've got uh, SMU. Who else is in there? Cincinnati, Connecticut. By the way, Cincinnati and Connecticut are two. They're desperately trying to figure out what's going to happen to them. You know, where are they going to go? So you've got Conference USA, which continues to get bigger. The Mid-American Conference, which just last week kicked out University of Massachusetts. They told UMass, either join in all sports or you're going to get kicked out. And UMass said, we're not going to join. So they are now without a conference. Uh, you've got the Mountain West and the Sun Belt. And these are the various bowls that are associated with those, uh, those conferences. Okay. Last few slides now. I'm going to get into uh, how schools have paid for a move uh, athletically and how they currently sustain uh, these athletic programs. This gives you an idea of where uh, the Sun Belt conferences are in terms of retention rates, the six-year graduation rate, the average SAT score. Uh, again, it gives you an idea academically of the strength of, uh, of the conference. Our academic, excuse me, our uh, graduation rate of 39% would be in that bottom quartile, especially as you compare it to, uh, to App State at 67. And is that right, Louisiana Monroe? That, that cannot be right. Um, but anyway, we'll, for our purposes today, uh, you can see that uh, on average, during the 40s or the 50s, you have a couple outliers. Uh, this gives you an idea of where we currently are in terms of our enrollment. $55 million endowment. Uh, the rankings from the U.S. News put us 55th in the regional uh, classification. Our average ACT score, which Libby has gone up, uh, our retention rate and our ACT scores are both uh, going up. And you can see what, if you were to translate, what an ACT score would mean in an SAT score. That's, uh, that's the number right there, 1030. Okay, by enrollment, within the Sun Belt, we'd be the ninth largest. You can see where we would go, uh, where we'd be in terms of uh, uh, rankings. Our endowment would be higher of two other institutions. Our current retention rate would put us at seventh. Our uh, uh, graduation rate, again, uh, would be at eighth. And again, the entire PowerPoint will be put up on our website, as will the, uh, uh, the uh, video today. So if you want these numbers uh, for later reference. This is Roy Kidd Stadium, named for one of the great gentlemen and the great icons of uh, college football. Seats 22,000, but where would that put us in relation to other schools in the Sun Belt? Now, the Georgia State, uh, the Georgia Dome is a little bit misleading because they play where the Falcons play. Uh, and I think, are they building their own stadium on campus? I don't believe so. Uh, so you can see, on average, they're in the 30,000. Uh, there are a few that are a little bit lower, uh, but on average in the 30,000 range. Now, this is the current Ohio Valley Conference. This is data from the conference office just a few weeks ago of our total annual budget. I just put a few on here for purposes of illustration. You've got Austin P, Murray State, SIU Edwardsville, Tennessee Tech, and Tennessee State. This is the total athletic budget. This is the university subsidy included. Now, when you say university subsidy, you say, holy cow. We're putting $9.3 million in athletics. Again, where's the, most of the money going? To personnel and to scholarships and everybody. That's how they classify the university support of athletics. And then I've put this last category here of a student service fee subsidy included. So every single school except for us and one other, I only put on this one slide, uh, puts in some amount of student fees, uh, student subsidy into their overall budget. At Murray State, it's as high as $2.5 million. Our Kentucky peers, $50 a semester at the University of Louisville, a student fee for athletics. 
At uh, WKU, when they decided to make the change, they put, implemented two significant fees. One was a campus enhancement fee that went from everything from uh, renovating their football stadium to rehabbing their music building to building a new classroom building. Uh, so it was really uh, kind of a wholesale uh, approach to some of their uh, facility needs. But they also implemented a athletic fee of $212 per semester per student. And you can see that uh, that's for full-time students and part-time are also assessed a fee. How do other universities in our conference currently pay for it? You can see Austin P, UT Martin, Eastern Illinois. Our historic rivals, how have they paid for that jump? When App State got together and said, okay, we're gonna make this move, how are we gonna pay for it? They went to their student body, and they went to their faculty senate, and they went to their board and said the only way we can afford this is to implement some kind of a fee for their purposes, it was $334 a semester. Now, uh, I was at the legislature on Monday and Rita Smart came up to me and she said, I had a student stop me on the street the other day and say, what is going on at EKU? We hear President Benson is increasing my tuition $2,000 to pay for athletics. And I said, well, Rita, please relay back to that student that that is not true. We are not raising tuition $2,000 to pay for athletics. We have not even decided to raise uh, our fees uh, for athletics. It's in discussion, uh, and we're still having that discussion about what to do with, uh, with our tuition. But this gives you a snapshot of what's out there um, in terms of uh, both our current rivals in the Ohio Valley and also Sunbelt School uh, institutions, Sunbelt Conference. Finally, uh, this last slide, uh, I'm showing you uh, right here in the middle, Radford University. Anybody know about Radford University? Where is it? Southwest Virginia. Uh, professor, what do, you, what do you know about Radford? It's public. It's a, it's a public, but it kind of has that feel to it. Yeah, it's a, you know, a public ivy, as they would say, a small uh, public private arts institution. But they charge $1,150 per year per student for athletics. So um, I just want to make sure we're, we're clear here that we have no current athletic fee for students at EKU. We are talking about the possibility of phasing in over time if we are going to make this move a fee that would help pay for some of the things that we need to pay for if uh, indeed we get the invitation to, uh, to make that, uh, that leap. Let me conclude with this uh, last statement. I've said this before, and then I'll open it up to questions. Um, everything is still in flux. Joining a conference is like being asked to be married. Uh, you can't impose yourself on someone else. You have to be asked. So we have not been asked yet, and all we are doing is preparing ourselves to be ready should that invitation present itself. And then if the invitation comes, we make a decision as an institution uh, in concert with our Board of Regents, is this the best thing to do for us now and in the future? So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or address any questions that you might have. Yes, why don't you come on up to the microphone, if you would, please? And as you're coming up, Mark, did I leave anything out? Mark, you want to say anything? Okay. If you would tell us who you are and uh, just state your question. Um, oops. Hi, I'm Rachel Keys. Um, my question is, when will we know whether we're being accepted into a conference? Because I've been told that the fees um, that you all, that the administration is looking at will be implemented for the um, upcoming fall semester. Uh -huh. And I think I would speak for a majority of students saying I wouldn't want a surprise athletic fee coming up. Uh, we have not been invited, as I said, uh, to join a conference. Uh, we've talked about, as you know, we're, there, there's, a, there's a schedule as to when we have to put the notice out as to uh, when, what we're going to charge for tuition. The tuition will be set by the Council on Post-Secondary Education at their meeting on the 29th of April. Uh, we have a current fee structure uh, uh, already in place. We have not made changes to that, so uh, until we know what's going to happen with the conference, uh, we're not going to make any decision about fees moving forward.
Hey, Ryan. Good. Um, I was just wondering um, if there was a buyout or potential uh, exit clause with the Ohio Valley Conference right now. That's a good question. Ryan Parsons, a member of our basketball team, who, uh, by the way, uh, took the LSAT on a Saturday morning. And then did you have to take a bus to meet the team for that game? There we go. So the parent bus picked them up uh, yeah. Yeah. and took them to the game that, after, that, that evening. Uh, his question about is there an exit fee, there is. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it is. I can't remember how much it is. Yeah, if you give them enough advance warning, sometimes the fee is diminished. Uh, most conferences do. It's not going to be an exorbitant amount of money. Uh, you know, one, one episode recently, I'm trying to think who had to pay a lot of money, and they got really upset, and they sued, and it went back and forth. So, yeah, it was West Virginia. Thank you. When West Virginia left the Big East, and went to the Big 12. So um, just so you all know, I have had this conversation with Commissioner DeBush. We have kept them apprised at all times. We've said we are happy in the Ohio Valley Conference for now. We've been there since 1948. Until you kick us out or until we get an invitation to go somewhere else, we're going to stay there. So she knows exactly what we're doing, and I told the presidents at our meeting in February what discussions we were having. Anybody else? Yeah, come on up, and then we'll go over here. Hi, uh, Todd Hart, History Department. Um, I guess in talking to other faculty members, I haven't met any faculty who are in favor of this move mm -hmm. and uh, all who are opposed. And uh, it just, it seems like a very divisive move to take at this time. So any response to that? Uh, I, would, I would answer that question with a, with a question. And if you would, um, I would be curious as to why they're opposed to it. I think a lot are worried about the financial uh, implications. That doesn't seem realistic. I think also uh, academic, it doesn't seem like a move that would necessarily help our academics. Um, I, I personally, I would rather see us move to Division Three, uh, eliminate scholarships, reduce our athletic budget, uh -huh. um, expand the number of sports, uh, perhaps have faculty involved in coaching, that sort of thing. Amy, you ready to start coaching? Uh, I certainly respect the position uh, of the faculty and, uh, and respect the fact that that's the beauty of a university. We can have different opinions and we can dis discuss it. Uh, I would argue that uh, this is one of those leaps of faith that we have to take collectively, uh, that maybe this was not a convincing presentation in terms of what this would do for our institution in terms of exposure and reputation and being associated with the different groups of schools uh, that were more akin to as opposed to more dissimilar. Um, I can promise you that there will be some growing pains at the front end. Western Kentucky, I think their first season in FBS, uh, I think they won zero games. Uh, that will be hard for a fan base to try and stomach. But if you had said, uh, Western Kentucky, do you want to stay where you are? Or look where they're headed now uh, and look at the exposure that the institution has gotten and the increased support from alumni, from donors, uh, from the state, their increased uh, enrollment. Um, this is, as I said at the outset, this is one of many factors that were, or one of many improvements, if you will, that we're considering at the university. It's not being made in a vacuum. Uh, we're first and foremost an academic institution, but the athletic enterprise is an, is an important part to that. And uh, I would be happy, I've met already with the Executive Committee of the Faculty Senate, and if the faculty want to have a kind of an ad hoc meeting about this and I can address their, their questions uh, head on, I'd be happy to do that. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is David Miller, and uh, I saw the list of coaching discrepancy that we have between other schools. Mm -hmm. Are we also going to look to hire personnel to help expand our brand so to speak, like with broadcasting, media, things like that. Yeah, I, the, maybe I, I breezed over it, but it had two columns. It had coaches and kind of administrative personnel that kind of fit into that support group that you're talking about. You're talking about trainers, advisors, people that would help with media, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, I'll give you a good example. Um, 
Ohio Valley Conference has a contract that now their football games are on, what is it, ESPN3. It's not ESPN8, but it is ESPN3. And you can get that on the internet, and you can see once in a while, I think we had two games this last year on, uh, on national TV. It was a Tuesday night, it was November, I was home, the kids, had, we had put the kids to bed, and I've said this before, I said it to students uh, last week, the number one sport in America in terms of viewership is the NFL. If you take the NBA, Major League Baseball, and hockey and add them together, they do not equal the amount of revenue generated or the viewership or the participation of Americans in supporting the NFL. By association, college football is the biggest uh, spectator sport in, uh, in America. Uh, March Madness, you might say, it has that three-week period where it, it, it sort of competes, but the numbers don't lie. And on this Tuesday night, I turn on the TV, and I go through the ESPN stations, and there's one football game on, one game, and it's Western Kentucky playing Louisiana Monroe. And it's on ESPN, not ESPN 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. It was on ESPN. And they had three and a half hours of basically a public service message about the campus and their programs and what they were doing. Now, I don't know what the Nielsen ratings were like. I don't know what the viewership was. But that was three and a half hours of advertising on a major station uh, that we have no access to right now. That's just not a possibility for us. So that's another uh, added benefit of, uh, of moving uh, not only up a, uh, up a notch, but also into a different league if that's possible. Now, when I was at the University of Utah, the University of Utah, uh, when they joined the Pac-12, they now get from the Fox Sports contract every year at Utah $25 million. We'll never be in that sort of category. Uh, but it's, uh, it's certainly changing across the country in terms of revenue generated from TV contracts. Sheila? Hi. Hi. This is really more of a comment than a question related to faculty concerns about this. As chair of faculty senate, I get a lot of emails, phone calls, notes, and uh, as far as athletics goes, that's no different. I've gotten lots of communication from faculty about that, and I really wanted to address the comment um, that the professor made earlier. Yes, there are some faculty members who don't necessarily see this as an advantage, but there are some who do. So just to be clear on where faculty stand, it's a little divided. Okay. There are some who, who want to see this and understand that there's an association, academically speaking, with the schools in these conferences. And that's something that you might want to speak to as well. When you see the other schools that are a part of these conferences and you look at their academic performance, Parents are making a decision on the rigor of those institutions. So I just wanted to make that comment. Yeah, it's a very good comment. Thank you, Sheila. Um, you know, the fact that UT Arlington, for example, has a medical school. Uh, they've got some of the best science programs in the state of Texas. You've got, again, I'm using, conference, I'm using uh, institutions in the Sun Belt. You talk about the MAC, and a lot of people say, why don't we get in the MAC? Because institutionally, don't we want to be with schools like Miami, Ohio, and Bowling Green? in Northern Illinois and Northern Michigan, excuse me, Central Michigan. Um, so they're, again, it's, it's kind of the company you keep. And for a school like uh, Louisville to now be in the ACC or Utah to be in the Pac-12 or Missouri to get into the SEC, there's some that said that academically, uh, you know, the Big 10 or the Big 12 is superior to the SEC in terms of academics. And I won't go into that in discussion today. Uh, but uh, it, it, it is beyond athletics, Sheila. You're exactly right. It's uh, the, the association with those other schools. And I've been in conference meetings where they talk about the relationships of the provosts in those conferences, uh, the partnerships. At the Big Sky, we did a, a student-sponsored peer-reviewed journal for student-athletes. Um, the alumni directors get together, uh, share uh, kind of trade secrets. So it's beyond the competition in athletics. It's, it's that institutional kind of uh, camaraderie that one feels in a, in a conference where you really feel like you've got a home. Yes, sir. Uh, Bart, in admissions, uh, I guess a two-part, really. Um, I guess the first part is, um, and this would be hard, a timetable of when this could happen. Um, and then the second part is, to be more appealing to a conference, well, we need to do the upgrades to the, to the athletic facilities first 
and then say, hey, look what we have here, look at our facilities, and then they say, okay, yeah, you, look, you guys look pretty now, we'll have you. Yeah. Is it, or would it be <laughs> get accepted, then do the upgrades? Well, it, it's probably a little of both. And to your first question first, uh, the NCAA has a June 1st deadline that if you're going to make an application to move from FCS to FBS, it has to be by then. Uh, who's to say we're going to have an invite by then? I have no idea. Uh, the improvements, the, the bonding, uh, $15 million, we intend to match that with private dollars. So upwards to 25 to $30 million of improvements into our facilities. Um, and you have to start now, you have to come up with a plan, which we're doing, we're developing now. Uh, some of the things that are cosmetic that have already happened, uh, I would hazard the opinion, and I hope all of you agree, that the experience now inside of Alumni Coliseum it's 20 times better than it was before the video boards went up. Uh, it was better at graduation. Uh, it's better at the football uh, uh, stadium. Coach Steen's going to have a chance to play in the lights here uh, tomorrow night. Uh, so all these fan improvements uh, certainly take, are, are noticed by people. But you have to do it kind of concomitantly, if you will. Yes, sir. Yeah. My name is Jason Hurdich. I'm a professor in the Astley department. So I'm personally a supporter of this concept. I think it would be wonderful for EKU. The exposure would be phenomenal. So I, I think the university is going to benefit from that. But one question I wanted to know, what kind of phasing will you do uh, as far as the renovations? Will you renovate the stadium first or are you expecting to do the Sunbelt Conference must invite us first, and then <laughs> after we've talked with them about it, then we would make a visit to other campuses like Western Kentucky and have a look and see what they're doing? Or maybe you've already done that. I don't know if you've started that, but I just kind of wanted to get an idea of your vision for the process and the phasing of that process. Okay, thank you. And the faculty also wants to know and make sure that the academic quality is going to remain a priority, that it's, that it's academics plus athletics. Correct? That's, that's what we want. Very good. Thank you. Uh, the second part first, yes, academics are a priority. Uh, you noticed that we didn't talk about general fund money going into uh, athletics if we're going to support this. Uh, the private dollars, the agency bonding that will go into facilities uh, comes out of other sources. Um, you know, there will be some people who hire within athletics that will be on the university payroll just like anybody else, but some of that will come also from the proposed student fee that we would phase in over a certain period of time. To this first part, as I said before, we're doing it um, not so much piecemeal, we're trying to make sure it, it fits together, but uh, a stadium renovation is going to take longer than, for example, the new floor and the new lights that are going in at Alumni Coliseum uh, this summer. Uh, how many of you notice how dark it is when you go inside of the AC? Um, and I don't think I'm just getting old, uh, but it's, uh, we are going to improve the lighting uh, next month. Is that right, Barry? And uh, that floor is the original from 1960, help me out, 1962. Uh, wasn't born then, that was a long time ago. 1962, we're going to replace that floor and get the kernel head turned the right way so it's not upside down on TV. That's a really important thing. <laughs> John Taylor, doesn't that bug you? Does it? Yeah, I know. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? This, I hope, will be the first of, of uh, several dialogues. Uh, I've had a chance, to, as I said, to talk to some faculty members, but Sheila, if you'll help me organize, or, or Amy, or Richard, anybody who wants to get some faculty together and talk about this. Uh, I met with the Student Senate. I uh, met with... Uh, of course, our Board of Regents, we've had this discussion, but uh, we can talk about this in more detail. If you've got more questions, Mark, Simon, other members of our athletic staff are here. Wardell Johnson the other day sent me an email and said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to address questions that faculty might have, so direct all the really hard stuff his direction. Uh, but uh, again, I want to kind of put a final point on this, and, th and that is that um, I, I asked the students the other day, I said, what do you think my job as president is? At the end of the day, what is my job? And some said, well, you're supposed to go out there and raise money. You're supposed to be the public face of the institution. I said, all those things are true. 
But in the aggregate, at the end of the day, my job is to make that diploma that you earned at Eastern Kentucky University mean more to you, to mean more to an employer, to mean more to a potential investor. The fact that you take great pride in the experience you had at EKU, my job is to improve that experience and improve the facilities and improve the reputation. And this is a component of a larger effort to improve the entire institution. So I thank you very much for being here today. Hopefully the rain has stopped and uh, go Colonels, thank you.